Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's event. I am going to start um, my presentation. Okay, so welcome. My name is Gabriella Coleman. I'm actually a professor, a newly minted professor at Harvard University in Anthropology Department, as well as an associate, faculty associate at the Berkman Center. And today what we're gonna uh, be doing is kind of giving you an overview a cursory overview of wearing many hats, the rise of the professional security hacker, a 41,000 word report co-authored by Matt Gorzin and I. I'm gonna start with a brief overview. I'm gonna turn it over to Matt Gorzin from Data and Society, a researcher there who will talk about um, a technical method that was innovated by hackers. And then I'm gonna turn it over to myself to talk about a short section that I worked on and then we will have Brian uh, Friedberg, who is a researcher at the Shorstein Center, lead with a Q&A. So to start, I'm actually in a, you know, this Data and Society report, which is coming out this week, I'm going to start with a video to set the mood and the tone of the 1990s when hackers were transitioning to the security field. This is Window Schneider, a very respected security researcher and former hacker who's talking about the 1990s. So let me play this. Yes. And uh, I fell in with a group of, uh, let's say, computer security hobbyists in Boston. <laughs> Voluntary sysadmins. <laughs> this, this, this space where they're at the time, there wasn't. There wasn't a set of books. I couldn't go, you know, join a program and take a class and any of this stuff. So we built our own tools. We came up with our own systems for figuring this stuff out, for identifying vulnerability, for building resilience. And um, it uh, eventually turned into an industry because other people found value in this work, which is fantastic. So here is Snyder talking about the fact that during the 1990s, these so-called hobbyists, AK hackers, we're basically in the know when it came to security. Um, however, it was not an academic field. It was very hard to learn this knowledge. Um, and it was hackers who, who had acquired the knowledge um, in the security field, often by getting their hands on illicit documentation. And then she sort of talks about how they were just sort of valuable and accepted into the security field. But in fact, a lot had to happen for hackers to be kind of accepted into security, um, the nascent security industry. And so while they were experts, part of the problem was that they lacked credibility. They were hackers. We know that hackers were branded negatively in the media. Um, more so, many of them, as they started to transition from the hacker underground, into the security industry, they wanted to retain the hacker label. And this is important. You know, it would have been much easier if they just wanted to shed it. And then finally, another problem as they were entering into the security field was that there were some experts, academics, journalists who were like, do not touch these so-called experts with a 10-foot pole. And I wanna just give you a taste of that um, to give you a sense of how hard it was to kind of maybe convince the public that these were the people that you should hire. So there was a group of hackers who created a security firm in the 1990s, ConSec, um, in the early 90s, and that um, company failed. And there was a journalist who wrote about it, um, who basically said, you know, would I hire a safe cracker to be a security guy at my bank? Right, so a lot of people were saying, no, these people are not trustworthy. Here is another example of that. Um, so this is from the Association of Computer Machinery, and it is um, recounting what Gene Spafford, a very respected academic at Purdue, uh, was relaying about these you know, so-called hackers who were entering the security field. And basically he was saying, you know, um, hiring one of these individuals is like having an arsonist install a fire alarm, Spafford insists. Just, you know, because he can start a fire doesn't mean he knows how to extinguish one. 
So this is basically um, the milieu that these hackers found themselves in, whereby they had to establish their credibility, their legitimacy, even though they had expert knowledge. They didn't write this book. I just thought it was handy to note that they had to do this. And they had to do it when they were both um, proposing very controversial methods for exposing security. And that is what Matt Gorzin is going to talk about with full disclosure. And as they were calling the BS of Microsoft in particular, and other software vendors who were claiming that there was no security problem. So they were building their credibility as their reputation was already under threat and as they were doing controversial things. So now I'm going to turn it over to Matt Gorzin, who will talk about um, full disclosure. Hey everyone, I'm just gonna get my presentation going here. All right, so yeah, my name is Matt Gertson. I'm a researcher at Data and Society and uh, uh, Biela was my uh, master's thesis advisor and Brian's an uh, uh, old colleague of mine at Data and Society. So this is really a treat uh, to, to be here for this event. Um, so yeah, as Biela mentioned, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, a practice called full disclosure. And particularly we're gonna talk about how it manifested on a, a mailing list, a controversial mailing list called bug track uh, in the early 1990s that um, you know, existed for a couple of decades after that. Uh, one sec here. All right, so first I'm gonna talk about uh, a few precursors to, um, to, to the full disclosure movement. So beginning in the 1970s, um, the, the kind of like the, the freaks, the phone freaks, the precursor to the, the hackers that we know today uh, started sharing uh, information about how to exploit the US telecom system. Uh, so one of the, uh, one uh, kind of uh, zine associated with that was called the Youth International Party Line. And uh, it would, you know, share techniques and, and also technical documents. And then the 1980s, uh, you had the emergence of some hacker-focused periodicals. Uh, one was called 2600 Magazine. And it was actually a, a print uh, magazine that eventually could be found at Barnes & Noble. Uh, and another hugely influential electronic magazine was called um, uh, Frack, which you can see on the right there, the first issue of that. And both of these zines were kind of devoted to uh, initially, some of the, the, the freaking techniques that were talked about in the youth international party line, but also over time, uh, techniques for uh, gaining access to computer systems and that sort of thing. So this wasn't known as, as full disclosure at that time, but it was really like a, a, a subculture that was devoted to, to sharing techniques for uh, you know, manipulating and exploiting technology often to, to gain access or to allow exploration or to allow conversation with, with distant colleagues. Um, so here's a couple from the original Youth International Party line. One is a, a, you know, a technical diagram for creating a, a tool that would allow you to perfect your ability to whistle at the, at the precise 2600 hertz frequency that allow you to control the phone system. And another uh, you know, more low tech hack of how to uh, to send mail uh, and recover the stamp later on. Um, also in the 1980s, uh, BBS has started emerging. And so this is a, a screenshot uh, from the Demon Roach Underground, which was hosted by uh, one of the founders of the Cult of the Dead Cow, a, a notorious um, hacking and, and text file group. And so BBS has became a, a way that uh, people would share text files and exploits and ways to uh, you know, gain access to things. Um, and so this kind of like set the, 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 this was kind of the backdrop of how this type of knowledge was shared in, in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and towards the ends of the 1980s, uh, one really significant event occurred, which was uh, Robert Tappan Morris uh, invented the first like truly significant computer worm and it spread across the early internet and caused a significant amount of uh, cleanup costs. And so the US government and some academic partners established CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, 
Um, and also in the 1990s uh, on the heel of uh, legislation called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that emerged in the mid 1980s. Um, hackers associated with the Legion of Doom and a variety of other groups uh, were subject to law enforcement crackdown. Um, and so as, as Biela mentioned, um, in the early 1990s on the heels of this, some, some hackers started to try and go more legitimate, including Legion of Doom members uh, who created a, a company called Comsec, which was uh, devoted to you know, offering security services um, like penetration testing and uh, auditing and things like that. It was extremely controversial uh, upon its founding. And hackers accused them of using their kind of institutional legitimacy to, uh, to outcompete rivals or to snoop on them. And business didn't trust them thinking that they were, you know, just going to gain access, back end access to their, their systems um, to exfiltrate data. Um, and so Comsec folded in 1993, and um, one of the, the founders, a former or LOD member, Scott Chasen, who's known as Doc Holliday, uh, created a mailing list called BugTrack. And um, BugTrack was really like a, a, a core um, platform for what became known as full disclosure. So it was the, the practice of... Um, disclosing information about computer vulnerabilities and also methods for exploiting them um, in a completely, you know, no hold bars kind of capacity. And this, this was a also extremely controversial practice. Um, CERT had filled this sort of role of, uh, as a clearinghouse for vulnerabilities uh, in the 1980s, but a lot of uh, hackers, but also representatives from industry um, and you know, systems administrators tasked with uh, protecting computer networks and things of this nature, they were all kind of um, dissatisfied with how CERT uh, would often reveal only the most, you know, the, only the smallest amount of information about vulnerabilities and there'd be long lag times between vulnerabilities being submitted to CERT and being disclosed to the public. Sometimes they were never disclosed to the public at all. And so BugTrack, even though it was founded by a hacker, um, it attracted a wide range of participants. Um, so, you know, very early on, uh, you had people sending in posts to bug track from organizations like the MITRE Corporation, um, the University of Florida, people from NASA. And you could see all of these, you know, these, these uh, domains where these emails were originating. And of course, there were also people writing in from early hacker-led ISPs like Mindbox and, and Panics and uh, participants from early hacker groups like the Loft Heavy Industries and so on. Um, and eventually over time, uh, BugTrack uh, became moderated, I think in 1996 by Elias Aleph One Levy, who uh, was also at, uh, in the same year, wrote an extremely influential article for, for FRAC called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit, which offered kind of a general a technique for buffer overflows, which was a, a very um, uh, potent uh, exploitation technique uh, that still in some instances persists today. And so kind of this, this, uh, this association between institutional actors and hackers and kind of more independent systems administrators all oriented towards sharing vulnerabilities function as a trading zone for kind of a you know an extra institutional, extra establishment group of people to discuss practical techniques for discovering and perhaps uh, dealing with vulnerabilities in a different way, in different ways. Um, but bug track was also controversial because not only did it uh, attract um, you know uh, participants who had the positive you know project of improving security in mind, but it also there was a lot of suspicion that some of the hackers that were involved in the mailing list were you know, taking the vulnerabilities that they would find there and using them to engage in unauthorized uh, computer access or criminal hacking or things like this. And so this really you know, set some of the ground for the discussions that would emerge around you know, white hat hacking, black hat hacking, and later gray hat hacking, which I think Biela is gonna talk about um, subsequently. Um, and also at this time, uh, it's really important to note that there was uh, some 
computer security researchers like Dan Farmer uh, started developing tools. Like uh, one of the most notorious ones was called Satan. And uh, I think it's called the security uh, assessment. Uh, actually, I can't remember the acronym right now, but the point is it was, it was controversial, not only because, the, because of the name, but also because it automated a lot of these vulnerability detections techniques into a, a, a tool that someone could run on a, on a potential target to discover ways that it could be exploited. Of course, it could also be used by systems administrator to audit their own, um, their own networks uh, and figure out ways to patch it. So all of these vulnerabilities were kind of going into this, building this pool of knowledge uh, that could be used to a range of different ends. And so it was extremely controversial. Um, some people who defended full disclosure argued that it would increase pressure on vendors like Microsoft uh, to more quickly address security issues. This is something Biel will talk about as well. Um, also that it could facilitate the education uh, of people into the field of security more generally. Again, this was a time when there wasn't a lot of academic um, you know, classes being taught on the subject of security. So people who wanted to learn about vulnerabilities often had to, you know, either engage hands-on and on their own or, or learn from these kinds of packer and periodicals. Uh, so it could also empower systems administrators to, you know, patch or disable um, software on their own networks that was allowing people to get in. And in the long term, all of these things could contribute, uh, it was thought, to the security of, of the broad user community. Of course, there was also detractors. Uh, one of the main critiques was that it could empower a, a class of hacker known as the script kitty, which was someone who could just take you know, the exploit code posted on bug track and, and deploy it to, uh, to break into a system without even necessarily understanding the, uh, the technical you know, backdrop on which they're operating. Uh, later on, there was criticism that this kind of disclosure of vulnerabilities created market incentives. Uh, a lot of, uh, in the mid nineties, a lot of like security firms were starting to come out. So the argument was that by, by making vulnerabilities more uh, public, publicly uh, available uh, and incentivizing script kitties, you're also creating a market incentive where these, these co companies that were often staffed by the same people making the disclosures stood to profit uh, by offering um, solutions to those issues. And in the short term, you know, the, the basic idea that it could uh, endanger users. Uh, there's also backlash from the digital underground, the hacker underground, who saw the disclosure vulnerabilities and the resulting uh, efforts made to patch them as a threat to their own kind of um, power or also just ability to play and explore networks. So it was controversial, not only from uh, establishment actors, but also from the underground figures themselves in some cases. So ultimately, um, full disclosure, uh, and particularly as cited on bug track, had some very concrete outcomes. I mean, it put hackers in dialogue with respected mainstream technologists, allowed them to, to gain mutual trust. Um, also by the end of the 1990s, vulnerability disclosures by hackers who were using their real names rather than their handles were increasingly serving as kind of line entries on CVs. So people looking to, to find employment on uh, emerging security firms could you know, point to a vulnerability that they disclosed. Um, and also you know, the vulnerabilities themselves could in some instances serve as products as, the, as a kind of market in, emerged in the early 2000s for selling vulnerabilities. Um, but it also this created a lot of tension with the hacker underground because sometimes the people disclosing vulnerabilities hadn't necessarily been the ones who had discovered it and had instead had um, found out about these vulnerabilities through underground kind of trust networks. And then they were able to claim ownership in a way that would uh, enhance their professional career. And more generally, full disclosure moved the, the security industry into a, a model premised on awareness and vigilance. So instead of a, a security by obscurity approach where uh, security was achieved by hoping that, that these vulnerabilities would never be discovered, it instead created a you know, security model where discovery and quickly addressing and, and re you know, relying on security firms able to provide services to help audit networks and so on 
really became the standard. And so all of this also created a ambient kind of background throughout the 1990s where uh, you know, vendors had to be more responsive and there was more public awareness of security risks and hackers were able to leverage um, you know, that general backdrop um, uh, in their own interest and to enhance their own legitimacy. And, and that's something that uh, Biela will now pick up talking about. And uh, thanks for your time. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna pick up. Um, let me just move these forward. So basically, um, as full disclosure was developing as this, you know, very um, robust but controversial practice, uh, hackers individually and as groups started to do a lot of reputational work. And that entailed uh, educating uh, journalists, they were courting business opportunities. Um, and, you know, they were still, like I had mentioned, very, very invested in retaining the kind of hacker label and um, relationships to the hacker community. And as the security industry was, you know, interested in courting hackers, a very stark binary started to grow. There was black hats and there were white hats. And this is one way the corporations were trying to kind of control the message. And it, actually in the late 1990s, what is really interesting is that just at the moment where it seemed like the black and the white was really being sedimented, the Loft, which is a group that was based out of uh, Boston, basically came up with a linguistic innovation, which ran pa parallel to really intensive media efforts. And this was the coining of the term gray hat. So this is a quote from Chris Weisopal, um, the, the blue one, which notes that the commercial world was trying to adopt the techniques and capabilities of the underground, but wanting to draw clear lines. We didn't want to do that. They wanted to learn from us and take the information and commercialize it, leaving the tainted researcher behind. We were non-white hat. We wanted to be the researcher, to be accepted as the authority and get them jobs. And so the gray hat term allowed them to do some of that work, which was push against this stark moral binary and also convey that they had sound intentions, but they were also very much willing to rock the boat. And in, indeed, in the late nine, 90s, they were willing to rock the boat through publishing vulnerabilities, but also going really aggressively after the software vendors, especially Microsoft, which you know basically had a monopoly in the late 1990s. Now, the LOF was just one group. The Cult of the Dead Cow was another group that kind of went after Microsoft. This was not kind of coordinated between um, groups and individuals. It kind of happened organically, but as the 1990s marched on, it did become more aggressive. Um, Microsoft and their problems with their security came up in talks, in mailing lists, uh, posts, in advisories. But the most kind of rhetorically powerful way that uh, Microsoft was put on the hot seat was through tools that cracked Microsoft products. And, um, you know, I'll get to the tools in a moment, but just I want to make it clear that, you know, for years, for years, the response from Microsoft was that, you know, there is nothing wrong with our products. Um, it's really kind of malicious actors um, that that is the problem, right? And this is uh, one quote from Microsoft, I'm not gonna read it, you could read it up there, that conveys what their stance was, stonewalling, stonewalling, and stonewalling. So again, there was lots of groups and individuals um, who were participating in this pushback against Microsoft, again, in a moment where these hackers are also trying to rehabilitate their image. And the two most visible groups were the Cult of the Dead Cow and the Loft Heavy Industries. And there was some shared membership between the two, but Cult of the Dead Cow was the kind of slightly bigger, more diffuse group. Um, and so the two tools that they created um, or Loftcrack, which was a password recovery and auditing tool, and then Back Orifice, um, which had two versions. 
And that was a remote administration tool allowing for stealth remote control of Microsoft Windows 95, 98 machines with or without a user's knowing consent. Now, what's um, interesting about the, the tools is that they have some similar functionality, some differences as well, but the groups uh, behind the tools and the ways that the tools were presented to uh, the, the public and the hacker public and the nascent security world was quite different. Um, and so I, I like this quote from our report, which really captures um, some of these differences between the groups. So where the loft sought to present an image of the underground hacker as a Renaissance figure, the cult of the dead cow frequently played into the stereotypes of like the hacker menace in an ironic manner, laughing at the media's willingness to play up the hacker menace. Fittingly, another CDC tagline read, you know, hyperbole is our business. And indeed, when they um, released Back Orifice for the first time at DEF CON, um, a very famous hacker conference, you know, they went uh, full on theatrical. This was full on spectacle. So, um, Back Orifice's technical presentation at DEF CON was preceded by CDC co-founder Kevin Grandmaster Ratz. You can see him. He's pacing back and forth on a conference table wearing leather chaps, a thick chain necklace, and two holstered presumably fake pistols demanding of the crowd, when I say dead, you say cow. Um, another CDC member then encouraged members of the audience to use tools like Back Orifice in service of a particular goal. Hacktivism, he said, what we have here is a concept and a series of tools and a whole methodology that takes the slacker ethic out of all you people. We are making it easy enough that an eight-year-old can make a difference, can fuck shit up a little bit for the cult of the dead cow, right? So this was really, really kind of um, stirring the pot of controversy. They were kind of playing up the bad boy image. And, you know, Microsoft really kind of, again, stonewalled. They said, no, these are the bad hackers. Um, and then the CDC would issue press releases that kind of flip the moral narrative. Journalists would write about it. So they were the most kind of theatrical in this hyperbolic mode. But at the very same time that um, they were doing this, the loft, again, using a little bit more buttoned up approach was still quite aggressive against Microsoft. And then in the late 1990s, 1998, um, they were invited to testify in front of four senators, which you can see here. And even though um, this is a different type of theatrics, nevertheless, it was quite theatrical in its presentation. And this kind of catapulted them into the limelight. There was a New York Times Magazine feature article about them where they can also explain gray hats and their hands-on methodology. Um, so basically, you know, between the loft, which was kind of good cop, CDC, the bad cop, um, you basically have a period of time where these hackers are able to kind of interface with um, journalists and also convey security by spectacle, which we define as the following. It is the advancement of security by making both technical instances of insecurity and also the negligent practices not only public, but also really unignorable. The CDC's uh, back orifice can be seen to epitomize the process for the way that it staged a mediatic encounter between hackers and a powerful corporation, ultimately nominating both technical design decisions and corporate governance questions for public debate. They set the agenda in a very kind of powerful way. Um, you know, there was other kind of um, mechanisms and factors, but by 2002, Bill Gates had declared security under the guise of trustworthy computing um, as the company's highest priority. And they proceeded to kind of hire former enemies hackers to help lead the way. And in fact, Window Schneider, who I started my presentation with, was hired at this time. And she invited you know, many hackers uh, under the Blue Hat Security Conference. And although there were many changes subsequent to this period uh, that were uh, toned down the kind of adversarial nature of the late 1990s politics enacted by these hackers, um, this was really, really central in changing security and putting it on the map. 
So I'm just gonna leave it at that and turn it over to Brian, who will now kind of proceed with a Q&A period. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting a little bit deeper on some specific questions. Um, first of all, thank you for the report. Uh, after getting to read it, it not only filled in a lot of sort of gaps in the history of how a lot of this stuff came to be, but also serves as an excellent prelude to a lot of your other work, Dr. Coleman. Um, I know that this is a representation of a much larger body of research that the both of you have been undertaking for quite some time. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about both sort of like the joys and the challenges of putting together internet history research, um, what kind of materials you were using, how uh, journalism may have helped or made that process harder, and some of the interviews you've done. Do you want to start, Matt? Sure, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, so I mean, Data and Society funded us to, to do this work starting, I guess, like three years ago or so. And uh, it's, it's been a really interesting time. Um, I think like one of the most interesting things is that we, because of the, the, the you know, it's, it's about 30 years out from kind of the start of where we were looking. And, and that allowed us to have a really interesting uh, methodological approach where we simultaneously were really deeply engaged in archival material a lot of which is still available online, but like is literally vanishing day by day by day. You know, I was just I was just looking through uh, uh, our final proof and found a link to the original announcement of the bug track mailing list uh, that was hosted on Google Groups because it was a, a Usenet um, posting, and it's not it's not there as of you know six months ago or whatever. Um, but also, of course, because all of the people that um, we're talking about, for, for the most part, are still alive and, and maybe a bit more open to talking uh, honestly about what was going on, we were also able to complement that archival research by talking to, to the people and, and, and triangulating between those two things. In some cases, correcting the memories of people who have forgotten things, and in some cases, uh, having people tell us things that at the time were contentious or speculated on and confirming things it was it was really really fruitful and interesting yeah i'm gonna just add one more thing you put it beautifully um you know i'm thinking about this methodologically as living histories of the internet when you're doing um research on the present you could absolutely and you should absolutely document 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 and you know start theorizing but actually not enough time sometimes like passes for you to really understand inflection points um, or the significance of things. Um, and I, I feel like once 20, 30 years um, uh, passes, you can, you can do that, right? And being able to complement archival work with, with interviews is beautiful precisely because you can juxtapose them and do like a lot of fact checking. Um, and so I think it's a really fruitful method for kind of internet history. Um, and so while we have very particular arguments around the security industry, I think in some ways, hopefully one day we'll, we'll write up something about the kind of methods um, that we went through that would be of value to other researchers. Um, in the report, you talk in great detail about how hackers trained the media to write about them, um, both through uh, specialized access, but then also forms of punishment when the story wasn't quite right. Um, going back through, you know, them as primary materials for what you're doing, as well as sort of talking to um, some of the individuals involved, did you get any sense about um, how that style of engagement with the media, um, what they, how they how they learned to do that? I mean, the loft was especially good at that. And, um, you know, they had press packets, they had cultivated special relationships with specific journalists that they gave special access to. And I think it was also just very much a iterative organic process as well, where, um, you know, they would do an interview and then they would go out to dinner and have some beers and like basically talk about what happened, right? And in some ways, 
you know, probably like their tech methodology was applied to how they dealt with the press as well. Um, I think with the CDC, you know, they had a very different method, which was let's, you know, be a little bit crazy, right? In order to kind of court the attention and then be able to throw some other kind of grenade out there. So they're almost in some ways diametrically opposed, right? One was very like finessed and curated. The other one was like a little bit, um, you know, more freewheeling, but both were kind of very, very effective and very central to them being able to kind of control the agenda. Yeah, I think that's totally right. And also it's interesting because the CDC really had a, you know, their, their initial tagline was global domination through media saturation. And they really had a relationship with the media quite early on because, um, you know, it, like as early as, you know, beginning in the 1980s and certainly in, in earnest in the 1990s, typically when the media wrote about hackers, it was as this kind of like spectral, uh, you know, threat, right? And so CDC early on, you know, uh, under the, uh, the the guidance of their minister of propaganda, death veggie, death vegetable, they would, they would actually kind of like, I guess what we recognize today is like trolling really, where they would actually court media controversy, not so much to like improve the security agenda or even to rehabilitate the nature of hackers or the, the the image of hackers, but but more to like parody or to 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 point to the absurdity of some of those things. So I think I think Death Veggie published a text file on like how to make a bomb in the early 1990s or in the mid-1990s. And it was just completely absurd. But of course, you know, the media you know, it got some media coverage and then he was able to use that as leverage to like turn the tables and shame the media for their you know, bleeding headlines kind of approach to um, to things. And so I think by through those kinds of more like playful, uh, prankish, puckish kind of engagements, that also offered a template for the type of work that the LOF was doing and using that same kind of, leveraging that same kind of spectacle to actually change the conversation around security. Uh, I wanted to touch a little bit deeper on um, sort of motivations that, um, this this era of hackers um, engaged in. From what I was able to gather, the term hacktivist, as we know it today, that didn't really come into use until the late 90s. So sort of at the tail end of the period of time you were looking at. So thinking about the interplay between ideological motivation, economic motivation, and then a third sort of murkier bucket. For some, it seems to be play. Other seems to be the thrill of exploration. Um, if you could talk about if those categories are sufficient, but if not, what other sort of motivations did you see bubble up? I'm going to just briefly say something that kind of helps set the scene. I mean, obviously, like, for example, the loft had a business plan. We quote from it. We were very lucky to, to get it. Um, they were trying to court business. So some people, I think, you know, retroactively impute on them like, oh, they just wanted to make a buttload of money and many did, you know? But actually, I think reading, I read the um, autobiography of one member of the loft, um, right? As we were writing this, which was super helpful because it made me realize how much the loft was struggling to actually court business. Like they really just wanted to be able to like make a salary and work on this full time, you know? Um, and I just mentioned this because yes, they wanted to kind of make some money, but I don't think that the kind of gold rush, which definitely came about later was something that was obvious to most. And so from my perspective, it was mostly about doing the right thing technically from a narrow uh, security perspective. And yes, let's make a solid middle class living from this. Um, and then, you know, as the industry really takes off, I mean, wow, there is so much money to be made. And then that just kind of changes everything. So that's all I'll say around that. But Matt, I'm, I think you probably have more to say. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that is like conveys like the, you know, a, a big part of the approach to professionalizing. 
But I think like the bigger question of like, you know, activism among hackers or like pol like nascent political sensibilities among hackers, I think like, you know, obviously the, since a couple of the images I, I showed were from like the youth international party line, which was associated with like the Yippies in the 1970s. So there's always like this kind of, you know, politics that were part of the, the, the formation of the hacker scene. And I think in throughout the like period that we look at in the late 1980s and 1990s, a lot of that politics manifested as like a, uh, like a struggle to gain access. So, you know, either whether it's like, you know, act, like being able to access this new technological infrastructure and not be, be written out of it or not have that access compromise and also to be able to secure oneself. So, you know, they're one of the biggest hacker, politicized hacker struggles uh, before hacktivism was around encryption. Um, so like in the early 1990s, there's what's called, be called the crypto wars, where there was a real struggle over whether the public would be able to have access to like, uh, you know, gov like government level encryption, uh, which was being classified as munitions because of its military applications. So there's a lot of hacker, early hacker activism around that. But, uh, and also like, you know, a lot of the text files had kind of like a libertarian, like anti-corporate, anti-government, not necessarily both, one, one, of the, one of the two kind of uh, tendency to it. And so actually one of the things we're looking at now is like, I think those, that kind of hacker politicization can be understood um, through the idea of like a, what Chris Kelty's called a recursive public, like basically activism to secure your, your access to technology, your integrity as a community. And what we're really interested in looking at now in the subsequent work in part is um, how one, once professionalization and, and some of those issues around access were resolved in the 1990s, a lot of the hackers that didn't have the same technical skills or didn't have the ability to professionalize because they had criminal histories or had a, a very strong commitment to a type of politics that was outside of, you know, beyond just simply securing tech, like corporate property or securing technology or securing users, they started to go in different directions, right? Where they started applying and, and applying hacking techniques to political ends, right? And so that's when you start to see the more contemporary manifestation of hacktivism uh, in a variety of different directions. Which kind of leads into what I'd like to talk about next, which is the one of one of the, there's two really excellent um, contributions and definitions in this report, the security by spectacle, and then the bottom up securitization, um, which again, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's lots more to be said about that in the next report as well. But sort of the long tail of this security by spectacle, sort of the, the practices, the media engagement, um, the institutional impact um, that these groups had, um, those that toolkit was passed on to other generations. And even if originally maybe these weren't done for what we would call ideological reasons, um, they became sort of the deep lore of the next era of, you know, sort of political hacktivist ideology. So um, maybe sort of transitioning more from the next era, so mid, early to mid 2000s, like what, what do you see as sort of the long tail of this practice? Should I go first? No. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, in, in many ways, this report and, and the related work is like a prelude to, um, you know, Biala's work on anonymous and other hacktivist groups. Um, and I think like, you know, it's, I think, I think it, you could think of it like similar to how the Cult of the Dead Cow and their kind of more prankerish, trickstery kind of like media play um, gave way to like these more, like these techniques that could be used to, to set the agenda around what security meant. This kind of the idea of bottom-up securitization. I think like it's still the case that, you know, similar techniques like these could be, and, and to some extent are being used today to challenge the, what security means. So, I mean, in the most direct way, you see the hacktivists that kind of 
grew out of or were inspired by these communities like Anonymous that were using kind of hacker techniques and also media um, you know, manipulation techniques to really challenge the idea that uh, like, or really to confront the security, what you know, they would call the security intelligence or complex, right? Like, so, you know, drawing attention to the emergence of like private security firms that were developing tools that could be used by governments to crack down on activists or to, to surveil their citizens. So we're actually like making an argument that insecurity could be used to, you know, could like exploiting security vulnerabilities could actually be used to draw attention to other types of security concerns, right? And today we're also, of course, having seeing a lot of discussion about security on social media, security of algorithmic systems and so on. And so it's interesting to think about how similar techniques of like bottom-up securitization and, and media agenda setting could be used to shape those kinds of conversations and, and, and expand the circle of what we consider to be computer security and what types of people should be involved in those conversations. I mean, this the, in the 90s, it, it took the inclusion of these kind of hacker outsiders what types of figures need to be in the room today to, 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 to uh, elevate our understanding of what the security risks facing us are and how they can be addressed. What, what do you think, Bial? Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I'm just gonna add maybe two things. One's a point of emphasis on something you said and something slightly different. I mean, it's interesting because the security industry as it formed was very technically oriented, it tend to serve kind of corporate and nation state in interests. Um, there wasn't even like a kind of pro bono arm for most firms to do kind of civil society um, security work that came with groups like the Citizen Lab. Um, so it's very narrow, but also there was like a very unethical place too that the security industry went with groups like NSO um, and hacking team so that security was used to like basically hunt down dissidents and activists. And I'm mentioning that because one of the questions kind of gets to that. And it's interesting to see how like the uh, kind of different era of hacktivists use spectacle and a different sense of security to put that on the map, you know? Um, but the people we kind of looked at and studied didn't quite foresee some of the like most unethical uses of security in the security industry. The other thing too, just very briefly, and then we can get to the audience questions is, you know, the era that we looked at, there wasn't really social media, right? So you really had to kind of court your spectacle to be threaded through establishment journalism. And today the game has changed, right? With social media, with social movements coming out of the image boards. And so there's both more opportunity for spectacle bypassing initially the media. You always kind of need them at the end, you know? But it's also like there's so much noise out there as well that I think it's really hard to kind of create sustained conversations over time. And the way that I think happened in the, in the late 90s, everyone was kind of on the same page over these security issues because you had less noise. So do you want to uh, look through the, the Q&A? Should we turn to audience? Let's do it. Sure. There's a lot of great question. I mean, I'll start with the first one very briefly and maybe Matt, you could look at one to follow up with, like, can Luis uh, Melacon, could you please elaborate as to why the spectacle was necessary in the first place? Why are companies like Microsoft so reluctant to admit and fix vulnerabilities in their systems? I mean, I think just back at the time, it was a combination of, first of all, no one likes to point, you know, um, point out that you have dirty laundry, right? Um, and that's never kind of an easy thing. Second was like, again, when people were building software, there weren't kind of security minded protocols for the building of software. And that wasn't necessarily obvious to people. And third, you know, there was a long period on the internet where, you know, there weren't malicious actors, right? And so in some ways, um, it, it really wasn't seen as a problem because it wasn't as much of a problem. So all of these kind of you know, um, converged to create 
this situation where there was clearly a problem, but people in charge were denying it, right? And so you really, 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 really had to rattle the boat to make that that obvious. Matt, do you want to answer a question? Yeah, sure. I think, um, I mean, there's a bunch of interesting questions here. I think a lot of them can be kind of answered by reading our report. And I'll just mention <laughs> the, the report. I mean, well, one, one, of the, one of the questions is, <laughs> sorry, one of the questions is where is the report posted? So it's actually going to be posted in, in the next, so ho hopefully sometime this week, it'll be on the Data and Society website. So that's datasociety.net. Um, and yeah, I just, you know, some of the group, some of the questions are like elaborating on, on certain things we've discussed, like the hat terminology, for example, and that's something we cover in depth in the report. I think I'll, I will, you know, I'll, I'll take a crack at answering a question from Shaka McGlotton because it's, it, so they ask, can you say more about the articulation of the politics of hacking, the broader socioeconomic context of this period, and the outsized role played by techno libertarianism in the tech world today. So I, I think, I mean, this is a big question, uh, but that it's something that we're, we, we explore a little bit in this first report and that we want to tackle more head on in subsequent work. And I think, like, you know, I, earlier I, I mentioned kind of the recursive public approach to hacker activism and like the, the effort to secure access to information, access to encryption, access to infrastructure and so on. And so I think like after professionalization occurred around like the year 2000, you start to see a couple of different things. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think like the, the defining computer security and cybersecurity on such technical, on such technically focused terms was a way to kind of obviate politics for a lot of hackers in some way, because it allowed them to kind of like focus on this, you know, thing that, that they cared about, which was improving security solely on kind of like technical terms and kind of sidelining the question of what the politics of, of that engagement was, right? Like securing uh, a, a software so that it's user, a user can't have their credit card information stolen. I mean, that seems like good to most people, right? And so what you see in the backlash to that, which is something we're gonna talk about in our next report, is basically challenging that idea and challenging the idea of whether you know securing products that are being pushed by big corporations or securing uh, infrastructure that is being used by governments and not necessarily being made to serve the interests of particular communities is necessarily what security should be about. And so that's kind of where, where hacktivism takes things. I think the, you know, the techno-libertarianism extends from, from that idea that if you can just focus on uh, solving these technical problems, then, then that's all you need to do, right? And maybe from one kind of very liberal perspective, that's, that's the case, you know, it's this kind of like societal progress in step with technical progress of like patch, patching all of these issues. But I'm really interested in grappling with these bigger challenges to, to that approach to security, which is saying, you know, what is this, what are these software actually being used for? What sort of infrastructure is not in place that should be there? You know, what, what infrastructure do communities use? How do they have control over that infrastructure? How do they define what security means for themselves? You know, and I think there was, um, you know, people in, in, the, in the early hacker world that cared about those questions and you see them you see those questions come to front stage in the in the kind of wake, wake of this hacker professionalization that we talked about in the first report. So hopefully we'll be able to answer that question a little bit more head on uh, in the near future. Do, uh, do any other questions jump out at you, Bill? Um, yeah, I mean, I will take John's question um, and you know, I'm just going to read the last part of it. Um, you know, the terms of um, black and white hat seem to break down outside of a simple case. Uh, what about NSA group? Is it fair to say white black hat is a language that mostly has mostly to do with brand image on the part of the sec industry and governments based on the above? Does gray hat open a space for those who want to reject the framing of the world as a game of cops versus robbers? Um, and I just, I don't know, I think that's a really good question. I mean, first of all, it's interesting to note that, you know, a lot of hackers today will be like, uh, that terminology is a bit lame and outdated. 
um, you know, it served its purpose. Um, it's also interesting, you know, we do in our report address issues of uh, race and gender and harassment. And um, even in the security world, there's been a reckoning around language. Um, the hat one was not one that was taken up too much. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's one that in some ways people are leaving behind both because it's, it's done its purpose, it's outdated, but also some of the kind of racial connotations. But that said, I mean, I do think that um, it's useful to not have like stark binaries. And I think the thing that I always did appreciate about the gray hat uh, mentality and labeling and kind of ethic, especially in the late 1990s, is that you do need to rock the boat. You need to rock the boat. You need to rock the boat. You need to, to push against things, even in your own kind of like corner or industry. Um, but that's really, really hard. That's really hard to do if you um, are working in that industry. So what do you need? You always need kind of outsiders, for example. You need watchdogs. Um, you need those who are willing to kind of call out the problems. The process is, you know, perpetual and constant. And I think that there's something about like the gray hat framing that that kind of allows for thinking about those types of politics that are so central to, you know, anything where you have to be constantly pushing on groups and corporations to do the right thing. Matt, do you want to take a last question since we have just a couple more minutes? Sure. Well, I, I can just build off that a little bit because I think there's two questions that are asking kind of about the incentives, uh, the like economics incentives related to security. One about, you know, what, how much uh, resources Microsoft had to throw at the problem. Yeah, that's a and great one question. And uh, one about how, you know, how socioeconomics played into it. I mean... I think like, um, uh, you know, there's one, there's a concept of like um, security economics that, that uh, some people have talked about starting in the, in, in the early 2000s, in the early 2000s. And I think there's basically the idea that, um, you know, part of the reason Microsoft responded to these issues in the first place is because they threatened their, their bottom line, right? A lot of what the CDC and the loft were doing were, you know, jeopardizing Microsoft's uh, ability to defend its its products, and I think also feeding into some of the anti-monopoly stuff going on at that time. So um, I think the idea of like yeah, attaching uh, economic incentives or disincentives to security activity is is really compelling and was super important at this time. And uh, actually, Microsoft when it did um, start taking on these issues uh, more pointedly. Some of that was based on economic incentives as well. I think there was actually a moment around 2003 when they started adopting the security development or the software development life cycle, where they actually started pegging bonuses for software developers, software engineers to the security outcomes of their technologies. So again, I mean, this is you know, something that enhanced security insofar as we, we can equate security to securing software. Um, but I think Microsoft had a lot of success with, with um, taking an economic approach. Yeah. Great. It looks like we're, we're uh, done. So I'm just going to say that um, this report's almost 50,000 words. That's long. So there's a lot there. But please uh, give us comments and feedback. There's a secondary report, and we hope to turn this into a book. And there are missing pieces like you know, we couldn't interview that many Microsoft people. And some of the questions today kind of like remind me, oh, wow, we should do that. So um, I just want to thank uh, Berkman Center, Brian, Matt, and everyone who made this possible. And uh, just reach out to any one of us if you can't find the report. And otherwise, have a great day.